So I want to say happy Father's Day to all the fathers. Can we just give it up for the fathers in this place today? And this is a special weekend for a whole lot of reasons. And and so we want to welcome those who are watching online, those who are in the fireside. But especially on this weekend, we want to welcome every single one of you at our Hillside Fontana venue at Falcon Ridge Elementary. We're so glad you're here. This is our first preview weekend, and we are so thrilled that you are with us, and I'm thrilled to be able to be a part of of what's going on on Father's Day weekend with with a talk in the book of Deuteronomy. I don't know the last time you heard a talk in the book of Deuteronomy, but if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Deuteronomy. If you have a smartphone or a tablet, turn to Deuteronomy. You can follow with us there, and we'll get there in in just a moment, but but I have a, a deep conviction, a challenge that has been renewed this week in my studies um, as a father of three children, this, this, this challenge, this conviction is, is only more applicable to me that the most powerful thing in the world that I can do for my children is to help them know, trust, and understand God's incredible love. It's not about the education. It's not about the sports opportunities or the hobbies. The most important thing that I can do as a father for my children is to help them know and understand the radical love that God has for them and that they could see themselves as part of God's story in this world. That God has a plan for their lives. God wants to use them and that our lives go best God's way. When our kids were small, a a brand new Bible was released. The Jesus Storybook Bible. It came out when my kids were children. and, And we love, I still love the Jesus Storybook Bible. And the tagline, every story whispers his name. So the Jesus Storybook Bible goes through uh, certain parts of Scripture, and it talks about the story of the Old Testament, for instance. And it takes some of the things we've been talking about, Moses and the burning bush. But then it also points forward to help us understand how Jesus fulfilled these stories and how Jesus uh, was a continuation of a story God had been doing for a long, long time. When my kids were young, we, we came up with this idea. It was a little bit silly, but it worked. We, we came up with this idea. What if we don't just read the stories of the Bible? What if we act them out? And so we literally would start acting them out. We would be in Chicago when they were really, really young. And like our son was one and a half. And then maybe our, our middle daughter was like three. And then our oldest was four and a half. Yeah. That's a lot of fun. Um, and we would say, okay, so now we're going to read the story of Passover and Jesus' triumphal entry into the city. And we would say, who wants to be Jesus? Me! Who wants to be the donkey? Oh, me! And then one kid would get on another kid's back and we would walk through the living room reading the triumphal entry as one kid's a donkey and one kid's Jesus. Uh, we would read these stories about uh, David and Goliath. Who wants to be David? Me! Who wants to be Goliath? No, but we'd make somebody be Goliath and somebody would have to fall down and we would read these stories. And it was so amazing as they were young to see them enter into the story as if they were part of it. And the truth is, somehow as we get older, we lose the imagination to realize we're actually part of God's story. Our lives, our decisions can be part of God's ongoing story in this world. And as parents, fathers, particularly on a Father's Day weekend, we have this enormous opportunity to influence our children towards God, towards his story, or towards all kinds of other ways. But it's not just for parents. It's not just for those of us who actually have children. We all have this tremendous opportunity. And if you slow down long enough to read Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, you would see very often it's a story of one generation passing a baton of faith to the next generation. One generation passing a baton of faith to the next generation that you can trust God. You can believe that God is for you. And just like this generation in Deuteronomy, we, in 2018, we're at one of those crossroads where there's generations behind us that desperately need the baton of faith, of trust, of hope in who Jesus is to be passed to them. And we all have that part of the story that we can play a part in. I'm reminded of a story from Woodrow Wilson when he was the president of Princeton University. He spoke to a parents' meeting, and he came to these parents, and he said, I get many letters from you parents about your children. You want to know why we people up here in Princeton can't make more out of them and do more for them. Well, let me tell you the reason we can't. 
It may shock you just a little. I'm not trying to be rude, but the reason is that they are your sons and daughters, reared in your homes, blood of your blood, bone of your bone. They have absorbed the ideals of your home. You have formed and fashioned them. They are your sons and daughters. In those malleable, moldable years of their lives, you have forever left your imprint upon them. Well, that's a little pressure for those of us who have children. That's a little pressure for those of us who... Maybe we want to leave a legacy for another generation. But God actually does invite us into that part of the story. And he says, your life matters. Your influence matters. So use it in the right way. Use it in such a way to build your children, build the next generation up. So Deuteronomy, the big idea that we want to pull out of this is this. God is a loving father. And we can only fully enjoy our lives By following his ways. He is a loving father. Now, some of us would say, but I I don't even have an image for a loving father. I don't even know what that's like. I didn't have a father who loved me. And I get that that's unbelievably painful. All of us carry baggage from our families of origin and our upbringing. But here's what we want to do. We don't want to point to fathers, point to examples like me. We want to point today to, first and foremost, our Heavenly Father and say, here's where you get the best example of what a true father, a perfect father, a loving father is like. Deuteronomy gives us that picture. Look look at Deuteronomy chapter 7. I'll read uh, verse 9 for us. And we'll see that this is the model. This is the, the primary father. This is the good father by which all of us try to line our lives up. Moses writes, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. Moses is reminding us something that's actually fairly familiar throughout the Old Testament. This reminder that the Lord, that the Lord that is the Lord of Israel, the God who has called them out, He is God. He is faithful. He is a covenant keeping God to a thousand generations. It's this idea of the baton of faith that's passed down to one generation. That generation takes it, passes it to another generation. That generation takes it, passes it to another generation. That all of us have a role to play. In passing this baton of faith to the next generation, pointing people to God and saying, he's a loving father. He's a covenant-keeping God, and we can trust him. We can know him. The question is not, it's not will God keep loving his people? You can read throughout the Pentateuch, these first five stories in Scripture about how God's people run away, God's people rebel, God's people do what we often do. They turn their backs on God. And God never stops loving them. The question is, will his people, his children, keep loving God? This is because the very character and the very nature of God is is love. Let's get a New Testament perspective of this real quick before we jump into Deuteronomy. 1 John chapter 4 verse 8, John writes this. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is, say it with me, love. That's the very character. It's the very nature. Biblical definition of love has to start with who is God? God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. It's not just the nature of who he is. It's also how he acts. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. There it is, that we could have life. Life to the fullest, life eternally after we die, but life to the fullest right now, life through him. Verse 10, this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. If we're going to understand what love really is, it doesn't start with us and it doesn't start with our um, situation or circumstance or our perspective. It starts with God is love And he invites us into his love story to be a part of it and to see him at work and to see him do what only he can do. And that's why in Scripture, this idea, especially here early in the Old Testament, of God is a covenant-keeping God is so important. Because it's not like we often have love in in our world where it's almost a contract. If you'll just do what you'll do, then I'll keep doing what, what I want to do. Like, if you'll love me, then I'll love you. But if you stop loving me, then I'll stop loving you. That's not a covenant. That's a contract. That's a partnership. That's an agreement. 
Uh, A covenant is binding. Uh, A covenant has both sides making this agreement that we're going to do this no matter what. A a covenant is something that marks you for life. Uh, The best thing we have for a covenant is marriage. And so I don't take this ring off hardly ever. Why? Because it's a sign. It's a symbol. it's, It's not the reason I'm married, but it's a sign, a symbol of a covenant that I've made with my wife Holly and, and with God, that, that we're never, never going to stop. We've been marked by this covenant. And, and we, like Ruth and Billy Graham back in the day, we made a covenant that said we're never going to divorce. Divorce will not be an option. Now, they may make us mad and murder may be an option, but divorce will never be an option <laughs> because it's a covenant. It's a covenant. And back in this day, there was, there was all kinds of cultures. There were all kinds of understanding of what a, a covenant Meant. And, and the truth is, even as the world progressed, there were still cultures that understood this idea of covenant. In the 1800s in Africa, there was a Scottish missionary named David Livingston who went to Africa. And he's one of the greatest missionaries. And the, the adventures and the exploration that he had were amazing. But after he had been in Africa for some time, people back in uh, Scotland, they begin to get worried. And they, they just thought, we've not heard from him in so long Maybe he's dead. Maybe he's dead. So they sent a search party led by a man last name Stanley, David Stanley, to go and try to find David Livingston to see if he was still alive. The search party encountered great difficulties in their travels. They were plagued by disease, plagued by starvation. Many people were were fighting for their lives. They were threatened by cannibals in the middle of the jungle. At one point, the group encountered a strong, hostile African tribe near the equator, and the tribe showed no signs of letting them pass through. Stanley's interpreter said to him, maybe you should strike a covenant with this tribe to avoid death. Not knowing what else to do, Stanley said, okay, let's try it. So negotiations were started between Stanley's party and the African tribe. The the terms were laid out. The terms were agreed upon. And then a ceremony was started to confirm the covenant. A representative was chosen from each party. The two representatives went through a blood covenant rite ceremony. After blood was drawn from the wrist of each representative, it was mingled together with wine. Both people drank the mixture. Gunpowder was then rubbed on the mark where the cut was made so that it would permanently leave a mark on both parties to say, this, this is evidence. You can see it right here. We are marked forever by this covenant. Then there was a priest. It was a pagan priest, but it was a priest nonetheless, officiated the ceremony, pronounced blessings for following the terms of the agreement, and curses for violating the pact. Now that may seem weird to you, but here's what's weird. It sounds a lot like Deuteronomy in some ways. To seal the agreement, Stanley and the chief of the tribe exchanged gifts. The chief wanted Stanley's prized goat that he had brought along with him because he had a weak stomach and he needed the goat's milk. Um, Stanley wondered, then what will the chief give me in return for my prized goat that I gave him? And the chief offered Stanley his spear with his personal insignia on it. Stanley thought, I gave him my goat. All I get is a spear for this. But then he and his party are able to pass through, and and they pass through. And as the party travels throughout the darkest places in Africa in search of Livingston, he soon found out that when other tribes with evil intent saw the chief's spear in his hand, they knew he was marked by a covenant with one of the most powerful tribes in Africa. Do not mess with that guy. Don't mess with those people. And it was surely evidenced that they, they had the power and the authority of the chief of this tribe on their side. So rather than opposing Stanley, they would bow before him, allowing him to pass freely through their territories and providing him with anything that he needed. Stanley reported that he used the covenant right of this spear at least 50 different times in his travels through Africa. And Stanley was mightily blessed because of the covenant that he made. When we get to scripture, what we see is God, a powerful God, who didn't even have any reason to choose this group of people to be his people, to love them. He makes a covenant with them. And he says, you're mine. And when you're mine, there's nothing that anyone can do to you. You can trust me. And then there are certain things, guidelines, instructions that are part of the covenant. Since you are in a covenant, this is how you're to act. That's how we could refer to the Ten Commandments. 
It's not if you do these things, then I'll love you. It's because I love you, because we're in covenant. Now here are instructions. This is how life goes best. And just like these travelers looking for Livingston, there were obstacles. There are obstacles for the Israelites. There are obstacles for us in living in light of God's love. For the people here in Deuteronomy, the children of Israel, the obstacles were um, foreign nations, hostile nations, armies who would attack and destroy them. And sometimes they had this choice. The safest thing they could do was turn their back on God to follow this other nation. Idolatry throughout Deuteronomy is a big obstacle. Watch out, don't serve other gods. And that's throughout Deuteronomy. Be careful, don't do this. But listen, by far, the the biggest threat, by far, the, the, the strongest enemy in Deuteronomy that they're warned about time and time again. And listen, I think it's same for us today. The biggest threat they faced in Deuteronomy, the biggest threat we face is that people, I'll even say it specifically, that families, forget God. The biggest threat is not from the outside. The biggest threat is not what culture can do. The biggest threat is not what an enemy can do. The biggest threat is internal that we forget that our God is a loving, faithful, covenant-keeping God, and we neglect him and lose our, our focus on him. We start hearing all the other voices that clamor for our attention and we miss the loving voice of our Heavenly Father that says, I love you, I've chosen you, I've called you, I'm with you. There's nothing you can do to separate me from my love. But we can neglect to hear His voice. Mothers and fathers can forget, can neglect to pass on to their children what matters most. Trust, faith in a loving God. Because there's so many other things competing for our attention. So that's how we get to Deuteronomy chapter 6. And that's our text for today. If you want to look with me in your Bibles, Deuteronomy chapter 6 is the most famous passage in the book of Deuteronomy. I'll start reading in verse 1. And Moses is writing to the people and Moses writes, These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you. To observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess. So that, that's a purposeful statement. That's a statement that means there's a purpose behind this. There was one in verse 1 that we don't have in our English. And and that one was that you would observe, that you would do. But verse 2, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God. As long as you live by keeping all of his decrees and commands that I give you. And so that, another purposeful statement, you may enjoy long life. Hear, Israel, and be careful to obey so that, there it is again, it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. So in this passage, Moses is is reminding them of of the truth of God's scripture, reminding them of the the reality of of this covenant and saying, you're supposed to do these things. It's this idea of so that, uh, the, the instructions are given so that you'll do them. You'll do them. You'll obey them. This is like the ancient equivalent of what we say, I'm not just talking to hear myself talk. When we say that to our kids, Moses is saying God is talking So that you know how to live. So that you know how life goes best. So that you will do it. So that, secondly, your children and their children may fear the Lord as long as you live. Fearing the Lord in this context is not being afraid or scared. It's a reverence. It's an awe. It's an understanding His holiness that He's a powerful God and having the honor and respect towards Him that He's due. So that you may enjoy long life. This was so important back in that day where you didn't have long life. Many people didn't have long life. Um, But it's also the idea of not just how long do you live, but how much life is in your years. So that it may go well with you. This is the idea of um, being glad, being joyful, living a a life that, that is pleasing to God. So that you may increase greatly. This is to multiply or to grow, meaning physically, spiritually, emotionally, intellectually, that you can grow. And here's the idea, that God's promise, his promises will be fulfilled in your life as you walk out these truths. See, this is nothing new to the Israelites, but it's a reminder. you got to hear 
Because there's all these other messages. There's all these other distractions. And again and again, God is, is using people like Moses to bring them back to this place of understanding. It's like a wake-up call. It's this reminder. God wants what's best for you. God wants be what's best for your family. God wants what's best for our life. But here's the problem. How God defines what's best and how we define what's best are often pretty different, right? So often what we define as best is easy, comfortable, safe, secure, fun, happy. And that's not necessarily the way that God is going to work. God is going to work with purpose and meaning and peace and joy and hope. And it may not come through the things we look at as what are best. But then verse 4, it is by far the most famous part of the book of Deuteronomy. And, and Moses gives a command. This is what I want you to do. It's very simple. Here. 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 This, this is the Hebrew word Shema. This entire section is called the Shema. It's this thing to be listened to. And even to this day, many Jewish people, morning and night, they, they repeat this. This is always before them. It's being repeated, hopefully to be understood, not just here, but here. But here's what Moses writes. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Not like the gods of those other uh, Egyptians and other nations around them. The Lord is one. And here's what you're to do. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road. When you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. I think this is so interesting. Because if you read this and you slow down long enough to read this, it's not a list of a bunch of things to do. There's only one imperative in this section. The imperative is simply this. Hear this. Hear this. Know this. It's not this idea of you've got to love God. You've got to love God. Try harder. Now you should feel guilty. You don't love God enough. It's like, no, no, no. Stop for a second. Here. Who is God? Our God is one. Our God is the Lord. Like, like what's been taught through Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers. Our God is good. Our God is faithful. Our God is compassionate. Our God is holy. You can trust him. You can know him. You can become whole in him. You can have complete confidence in him. And, and then if you'll hear that and if we will remember that, then we will start to love the Lord our God with all of our heart and our soul and our strength. And we'll begin to teach these things to our children because it's who we are. But it's not just who we are. It's what we value and say, here is this idea of listen, but listen in order to obey. Listen in order to learn to know what to do. It's to perceive. How? How do we do this? How do we listen? By immersing ourselves in God's truth. By immersing ourselves in God's voice, by listening, by impressing these things. It's, it means to teach, it means to, to sharpen, literally. Literally to impress them on our children means to sharpen. But here's, here's the, the, the problem. Sharpen is a, it's a two-way street. On the one hand, it can mean sharpen in order to make more effective. But if we do it wrongly, to sharpen means to wound, to stab. And so there has to be a correct use of the word of God. We don't need to preach at them our children, preach at the next generation. We need to invite them into a conversation, Im impress them on them as we talk about them, as we walk down the street, as we um, bind them as symbols on our hands and foreheads, we write them on the door frames of our homes. The idea here is make it visible. Make it visible. To a, a, an ancient Jewish context, even sometimes today, it's this idea of make the word of God visible to you. Why? Because what we make visible in our lives, what we make visible in our lives is what's important to us. Do me a favor, grab your cell phone real quick. Just get your cell phone out. I know you have it on you. Uh, what, what we think is like valuable or important, we, we make visible to us. So what's on your, uh, your screensaver on your phone? Just tell me some different things you have on there. Your dog. Wait a minute, hold on, your dog. Your dog, because you value your dog. Your kids, because you love your kids. What else, anybody? 
your husband, your Jeep because you love your car. That like the things we, when I was a sixth grade middle middle school student, guess what was on my wall? Farrah Fawcett. Fawcett. (laughs) Listen, Michael Jordan's poster was on my wall. Because I wanted to be like Mike. Because I valued Mike. Because I loved basketball. The things that we make visible are the things that are important to us. The tattoos we get or don't get are because those things are important. We make them visible. And the simple truth that, that is being conveyed here is the things we value become evident in what we make visible in our lives. And so the reminder is, if you really love God, or if you really want to love God more, you got to make visible the things you say are important to you. And, And you may say, but that just seems hard. I don't know how to do that. Yeah, you do. You just don't want to do it. Like, um, for years, I was, um, hearing, eat your vegetables is good for you. But it didn't sound like good news to me. I thought it was really, really bad news. I thought my parents wanted to torture me. I thought, like, why would you do this? Nothing that's good for you should be able to taste this bad. But then the older I got and and the more I learn about, and this has been taking place for the last two weeks, I learned these things. The the, the older you get and you you realize, well, maybe they don't taste as bad as I thought they would. And uh, you learn it's good for you. you. You see people around you learn this lesson for themselves. You start to try it and you feel better. And by actually trying to do something by a discipline, you can actually generate your feelings. You can create feelings by the discipline of saying, I'm going to eat something even though I don't like it. And I've realized this. There is nothing like a California avocado on your cheeseburger. Amen? Amen. There's nothing like a garden salad with a heaping pile of tri-tip on top of it. So I'm making progress. I'm not there yet. But the point is is this. You, You can actually start doing things that help confirm what you know you believe but you don't actually feel in a moment. By the discipline of doing them. And in some ways, that's what Moses is saying. He's like, you say you love God. We'll go back to this. Remember this. God loves you. That matters more. And remind yourself that God loves you. And remind yourself of God's ways. And remind yourself and make visible in your life the promises and the instructions that God gives you. And then you'll start to experience the life God has created you for. Then you'll start to experience the peace and the hope and the joy. Moses is not giving a lecture saying, you people need to love God. He's saying, you need to remember how much God loves you. You need to remember how faithful God has been. You need to remember God is a loving father and we can only fully enjoy our life by following his ways. And then you may say, this sounds hard. Like, ah, it sounds like a lot of work. I'm not sure I can do that. And, and I would just maybe take it one level further and say it's not just hard, it's impossible. It's impossible on your own. But with God, all things are possible. When you get to the Jesus Storybook Bible and you get to this section of the Pentateuch where it's dealing with how God has worked, there's this beautiful passage where um, the, the Bible is telling the story and it says that God gave them rules like don't make yourselves pretend gods, don't kill people or steal or lie. The rules showed God's people how to live and how to be close to him and how to be happy. They showed how life worked best. God promises to always look after you, Moses said. Will you love him and keep these rules? We can do it. Yes, we promise, the people said. But they were wrong. They couldn't do it. No matter how hard they tried, they could never keep God's rules all the time. God knew they couldn't. And he wanted them to know it too. Only one person could keep all the rules. And many years later, God would send him to stand in their place and be perfect for them. Because the rules couldn't save them. Only God could save them. The Jesus Storybook Bible points us to something that is foundational. And the origins of the story are all, all directing us to this moment. We can't save ourselves. But Jesus has come to make a way. 
And there's a choice that has to be made. Even Deuteronomy talks about this choice that we have to make. Deuteronomy 30, verse 15. Moses writes, See, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. This is God speaking. For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, to keep his commands, decrees, and laws. Then you will live and increase, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. But even this is pointing forward to Jesus. It's pointing forward to how Jesus will make a way. And when you get to the New Testament and what Jesus is doing, it's called a new covenant. A new covenant. And just like a ring is a sign of the covenant I've made with my wife, just like a spear with the, the leader of a tribe's insignia on it is representative of a covenant. The cross is the symbol of a new covenant that Jesus has made with us. He makes a way. He is the truth. He is the life. And he invites us to follow him. And you see, the thing that, 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 that something like today means in, in terms of our legacy and in terms of what we pass on to the next generation, specifically in terms of what we fathers pass on to our children, there's really only one thing that matters more than anything else that we pass on. And it's not about money and it's not about skills. It's about passing on a trust and a love of our God, our Father who's loved us so perfectly, who sent his Son. We talk about it around here, about this moment where we make a decision to say, I believe. And the reason we use that language is because that's very similar to the language that Jesus used. When Jesus came um, to earth and first began teaching, one of the first things he said is found in Mark chapter 1, verse 15. The time has come, Jesus said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent, that's number one. And believe the good news. When, when it comes to wanting to follow God, when it comes to wanting to experience God's best in our life, step one is this. Step one is this. Repent. And repentance is this idea that our life is going in this direction. It may, they may be our ideals, our values, our direction. We're charting a course. And repentance is a turning it's a turning away from our life, our ways, and turning to Jesus. It, it involves a change of our mind. It, it involves a change of our lifestyle. It involves saying, I'm sorry for going my own way. Will you forgive me? And we turn, we repent, and we receive the good news. Repent and believe the good news. Well, what's the good news? The good news is found partially in, in that most popular verse, probably in the world, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. The good news is this, that, that Jesus has come that we could have life, and that life starts right here. That life starts right now with grace, with forgiveness, that, that we can be set free from everything that we've ever done and the sin that holds us back. It starts right now, but it also goes on into eternity. Eternal life with God through Christ. I have come that you could have life and life more abundantly. That's what Jesus says. That's the good news. That's the good news when we repent. But that second step is we believe. And believe is a, is a decision. It's, it's a decision, a choice to place our trust, our confidence in who God is and what God has done. Romans chapter 10, in verse 9, the Apostle Paul writes, If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. It's this belief that Jesus' resurrection changes everything. It's this belief that we need Jesus in our life, and he is able to meet every need, able to heal every hurt, able to overcome every sin, every addiction, every place of guilt. So here's the question. Do you need Jesus? Like, have you ever had a moment where you repented and you believed and your life was changed? And if you haven't done that, why not today? 
Why not today? There's nothing more important in all of the world than making this decision. And then there's nothing more important in all of the world to pass on to others, to pass down to our children, to pass on to our friends, to pass on to the next generation than a trust, a a complete confidence, belief that our God is a loving Father and He sent His Son on a rescue mission for us. Do you believe? Have you made a decision to believe? Have you turned from your ways and turned to Christ as that only option? If not, if you've never done that, why not today? And I'm going to pray a prayer. It's a simple prayer. There's nothing fancy about this, but if you mean this, if this prayer resonates with you, I'm just going to ask you to pray along with me there silently. And if you really mean this, God hears this prayer and everything changes. And everything changes. Would you close your eyes and, and pray with me? And I want to lead you in this prayer of repentance and belief. Dear Jesus, I know I am a sinner. And I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose again from the dead. I trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior. Guide my life and help me to do your will. In your name, amen.